It's like Smuckers with a name like that. You got they they have to be good. I'm like the Judds. Are you kidding me? But we just like worked our tails off, honestly. I mean, I, I would forget to eat. It was like very scrappy, when I say scrappy. And Bob gave me my Bob say, well, I think we should go talk to so-and-so and get some advice. I'm like, oh no, we can't do that. And he's like, why not? I said, because I don't want him to think we don't know what we're doing. <laughs> so I'm originally from upstate New York, not to be confused with New York City. Uh, where I grew up is the mid-Hudson Valley, two hours north of Manhattan and an hour south of Albany in a little town called Red Hook. It's a Dutch community. And I went to public school there. My father was a superintendent and a school principal and a teacher. And then I went to Wells College, which at the time was a woman's college. And that's an upstate, really upstate on the Finger Lakes. And I was really blessed to spend a year abroad and I loved living in, uh, in the beautiful France and traveled all over Europe and it was a dream come true. And then um, I was studying econ, marketing, communications in French and moved, took my first job was at MTV, parent company called Warner Amex Satellite Entertainment Corporation. Warner had made a lot of money in cable and in some programming and American Express of course was a credit card. So they merged, they needed to get rid of a bunch of money, and they needed a tax write-off, and so they formed Warner Amex Satellite Entertainment Corporation, otherwise known as WASAC, which was then purchased later on by Viacom. So we had multiple cable channels that we were working on. One was something called the Shopping Channel, which was sort of a precursor of QVC. One was Nickelodeon, which some people know as a kids' channel, was award-winning kids' network. Uh, and then we had the movie channel, which was the first 24-hour movie channel. We did something called interstitial programming, which was really cutting edge at the time. And we would do interviews with uh, various actors, with directors, and that was considered really interesting programming at the time. And then we had something called the music channel, which became MTV. We also were distributing the Arts and Entertainment Network, which then kind of morphed into Bravo. So it was really early, early. There was HBO, but and we had Showtime at the time, but it was really early cable television and baptism by fire. So right out of college for that. Well, I started as a secretary, which was like, tell so horrible to be a secretary. I was like, well, I didn't go to college to be a secretary, but I was banging away at a IBM Selectric typewriter. And I then got promoted. I was there for four years, and I was a manager. By the time I left, I was a media marketing manager. And I was dating a fellow who was a photographer, and at the time, nobody had cell phones, nobody had cameras in their back pocket, and so they would hire a photographer to shoot concerts and shoot grip and grin. We would call them grip and grin, parties, etc. And John would shoot all these parties, and he was working for the record label. So one night he might be shooting at the Garden, and it would be Eric Clapton, and the next night it might be David Bowie, and the next night it might be a symphony. And then sometimes he would get phone calls to shoot country music. And John was, uh, he had passed away, unfortunately. But he was a really funny guy, and he just hated country music with a passion. He went to FIT. He didn't understand country music, and he didn't really like country music. So he would call me out. He's like, I've got to go shoot these hillbillies. Would you like to come to the Meadowlands with me? And I'm like, sure, I'll come. That'd be fun. So he picked me up, and we'd drive out to the Meadowlands, and I'd get a backstage pass, and I had nothing to do but eat you know, whatever free food they were giving and have a beer and talk to people. And it's uh, one of these situations like ignorance is bliss, and I realized that some of the people I was talking to later on were the head of record labels, like Joe Galanti, Randy Goodman, Cynthia Spencer, who is a PR and marketing person, and a guy named Tony Brown, who's an award-winning, uh, amazing A&R guy and a producer who's produced tons of hits, a lot of George Strait hits, and Trisha Yearwood. And Anyway, that's who I was talking with. And I was so naive, I didn't know who they were. And so I was very calm. If I had known who they were, I probably would have been mortified and sat in the corner. Um, so they're like, what do you do? And I said, like, oh, we just launched this cable channel, MTV. And they're like, you work at MTV? Oh, my God. What do you do at MTV? Can we get some swag? So that's how I met, met them. And so Tony's like, hey, man, can you, you know, I really would like to have, like, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, okay, I'll send you some stuff. And I get a phone call one day, 
and they're, they're like, listen, we're looking for um, someone to work in PR and marketing, artist development, and it was this lady, Cynthia Spencer, and she said, I'm getting married, I'm, mar I'm marrying a pro golfer, I want to travel with him, I need to find my replacement, would you be interested in coming to Nashville and doing an interview? And I was like, I don't want to live in Nashville. I had been to Tennessee because I came for the World Fair with my family and we took a trip and we went to Knoxville and then we went to Nashville and went to the Grand Ole Opry and my sister and I were rolling in the aisles laughing at the advertisement of the Little Debbie's Snack and Cake and Martha White's Self-Rising Flower and we were just crying laughing. We're like, this is not happening. And fast forward, little did I know, <laughs> a few years later I would be working in country music. So once again, baptism by fire, totally out of my comfort zone. I grew up listening to rock and roll, did not grow up listening to country music. Um, funny enough, they kind of twisted my arm. I, I did agree to come to, the, to Nashville for an interview. They sent me a ticket. On the way to the airport, I've told this story before, on the way to the airport, I buy a billboard. And I'm like, somewhere in here there's a country playlist. Where the heck is it? So I look and I'm like, okay, RCA, 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 okay, fine. So I, in the interview, which once again, I was too naive and stupid to be nervous because I really didn't want the job. I wore a vintage dress. Who wears a vintage dress to an interview? But I, that's what I wore. And I was just really confident. And I'm like, hey, congratulations on Islands in the Stream. What a great hit with Tony, with uh, uh, Dolly and Kenny or whatever I said. I don't remember. But I knew what was on the charts. And I think they thought, well, she knows her stuff. Little did they know, I was like literally reading it in the, you know, play, playing on the way. I didn't even know somewhere there's a country section in this billboard. So I read a couple of things and looked at a couple of photos or whatnot. And then, this is also how naive, I was like, well, like, you know what? Nashville is not a media center, but New York is. And I was by this time in love with this guy. And I'm like, I don't really want to move to Nashville. I don't really want to move to Nashville. I'm like, can I just stay in New York and like fly, like come once a month? That's how audacity, how much audacity I had. And they're like, no, you need to be here. And I was like, all right. So I remember I hadn't accepted the job yet and they were doing a marketing meetings and strategic planning and Joe was all about doing that. It was very, very much about long range planning and marketing and focus groups and all that. So they flew me to Memphis for the first time and we stayed at the Peabody and I met all these people and they were going to be my um, co-workers, you know, and, and they were kind of like, who is this New York woman? What the heck, you know? So I think Joe liked me because he was a New Yorker and I was um, confident because I don't think I really wanted the job and so I just was like myself and and they were like okay we'll hire you well they moved all my stuff down I was just a pup I think I was 23 or 24 something like that and uh, I hadn't driven I had a driver's license but I, I'm in college I never had a car in New York I didn't need a car so I basically had an unused driver's license and I was mortified to have to now start driving. I was like, where's your, you know, where's your metro? You know, where, like, can I take a bus? So I had to learn, kind of basically learn how to drive. They like got me a car, they moved, they paid for my moving expenses, they found, helped me find an apartment. I was like, I'm not doing too badly here, you know? So there was, that was interesting. It was a huge leap of faith um, and getting out of my comfort zone. Well, prior to this first meeting in Memphis, I got this box in the mail, and there were cassettes. And they, I was supposed to listen to all these cassettes and be familiar with these artists. And one was this duo called the Judds. And I'm like, it was like Smuckers with a name like that. You got they, they have to be good. I'm like, the Judds? Are you kidding me? So that was the very first album, and I remember stopping and getting gas and I had the cassette playing in my car and people were like who is that they're really good who is that and I thought hmm that they might be doing well and then there was a guy named Vince Gill who who uh, had an album coming out called the things that matter which is one of my faves and let's see Bill Medley from the Righteous Brothers uh, I worked on Rhinestone the movie Rhinestone with Sly Stallone and Dolly which was filmed in Beautiful Leapers Fork let me think of who else. Alabama, um, Keith Whitley, 
what a sweetheart Keith was. He was precious. Uh, Steve Warner was there at the time. I'm trying to think of who else. Louise Mandrell. Uh, Eddie Raven was such a hard worker. I loved Eddie. Um, David Wills was on that roster at the time. Hillary Cantor, who was working with Even Stevens. Really interesting people. And I realized that I had so much to learn about the music business. I mean, I thought that if you looked at the Billboard chart, there's Kenny and Dolly listed on the Billboard chart. They wrote the song. I didn't know that there was this whole totally different subterfuge layer of writers and publishers and how that worked and how songs got cut and how royalties worked. I had to learn all of that. And part of the reason I took the job to work at RCA I went literally from college, studying business essentially, and learning how to write and learning how to think basically and strategize, to getting baptized in cable television and working a lot in music, but everyone I worked with at MTV had either been in management, had been at a record label, had been in radio, and then there's moi. And, and I needed to learn the music business. So I thought, let me take that opportunity to go to Nashville and my parents were being very supportive and learned the music industry. So when I decided quasi reluctantly, a little bit excited but quasi reluctantly because I was really in love at the time and, and everything I knew was in New York and I, um, I took the job and moved to Nashville and it was really baptism by fire. I had to understand the music industry. RCA was top label, had been top label for 11 years running. It was sort of always neck and neck with CBS at the time. And Joe was a taskmaster. He was so amazing. He was really a difficult guy to work for at the time, and so was Randy. But I learned a great deal. And we would have regular marketing meetings. And essentially what I was su supposed to do is we would have various uh, um, albums coming out, singles coming out, and it was my job to promote those artists, to get the word out, to write the bios, to get stories written, to get photos placed. Uh, we would do some tour press, but essentially it was launching whatever the priority was for the label, and typically it would be an album that would be coming out. And um, Earl Thomas Conley was also on the label at the time. and. I remember Randy said to me, every day you should do something for each of the artists you represent. Each artist needs to feel that they're a priority and they never want to feel that they're not or that uh, there's someone else that you're working on. So you have to make the artist, you have to make sure that they are being supported and they are listened to and validated. And I was like, okay, I can do that. I tried anyway. Um, and I can remember like Billboard would come out and Joe would count the photos. And if CBS had one more photo than we did, I would get called in the office. Like, what happened here? Why do they have three photos and we only have two? You know, it was one of those kind of things. You need to call. You need to call Jerry Woods. You need to call Keith, uh, Kip Kirby at the time. You need to call Kip. You need to yell at her. Why is this happening? And I was like, so I was scared to death. You know, it was really a stressful job. But it was, you know, it was, it was a good learning experience for sure. Going to Wells was very instrumental. Well, Wells was founded by Henry Wells, Wells Fargo Wagon Company and American Express. Um, and he was all about women's rights. He, his whole, the whole role of the college was to educate women. So when I went there, it was all about elevating. You can do this. And that's what I learned for four years. And then I went to Europe, and that's what I continued. It was like getting out of the comfort zone. You can do this. You've got this. You got it. So I had that. I had also strong mom, strong grandmothers, strong great grandmother, and there was a lot of that in my history. And I will say there were some role models here. Uh, there was a woman named Frances Preston who ran BMI. There was uh, Connie Bradley at ASCAP who was hysterical. I love Connie. And then there was uh, Joe Walker Metter who was at the CMA. So there were the, those three role models, female role models. Um, and they were very different personalities, but there was that to look up to. But at the record label, primarily there were not a lot of female role models. There weren't female producers. I remember Gail Davies produced her own album, and that was like such a coup at the time. 
There weren't female managers to speak of. Um, Mary Martin was doing a little bit of management and she was working with Vince Gill and she was like, amazing woman. She was an A&R background. She signed Emmy Lou, and she just was a force to be reckoned with. But there weren't a whole lot, to be honest. And I, I always found, really kind of felt like an outsider. I think maybe because I was from New York and culturally it was different. I talked too fast. I dressed weird. I don't know. I mean, I just, I liked this town, but I didn't really fit in exactly. I had to learn the culture. And and then I, I lost my job. I got fired. So that was huge comeuppance for me. And I can remember my grandfather saying, you need to get fired at least once and preferably before you were 25. And I did not disappoint him. <laughs> and it was pretty devastating. And um, what happened, interestingly enough, is my boss at the time, not Randy and not Joe, but another man who is no longer in the music industry, grabbed me. Uh, he made a pass at me and he literally physically grabbed me and tried to fondle me. And I was like, what are you doing? And I rebuked him. And shortly thereafter, I was moved to a closet. My office was put in a closet and they were trying to get me to quit. And I was like, I'll be darned if I'm going to do that. I've disrupted my whole life to move to this town and I'm not going to quit. So then basically they fired me. And I never made the connection between my getting fired and Me Too, the Me Too movement, until that happened. That's the truth. It never even dawned on me that, oh, maybe because I rejected my boss, maybe that's why we had to get rid of this woman. And um, at the time I thought, well, I'm just not the right match for the job. I'm not the right person for the job. And um, and I sort of limped along and licked my wounds and was mad and angry at myself and angry at Nashville and angry at RCA. And I'm like, well, that's pretty counterproductive. And I tried to move back to New York because that's where everybody I knew was and everybody I loved was. And um, of course, I lost my apartment. So then there was that safety net was gone. I called the guy that I was in love with. Who I was having this long distance relationship and he was like, oh, by the way, I'm seeing so-and-so, and this woman was a correspondent on Entertainment Tonight. So then I had to see this woman on TV all the time. I'm like, seriously, let's put some salt in the wound. And um, it was like dark night of the soul, for, for sure. So it kind of got me on more of a spiritual path after I got through with being mean to myself and mean to everybody else and having a pity party. I finally said, okay, this isn't working. This is not empowering. And I started to read some self-help books. I started to get back to some spiritual grounding and I pulled out of it. And in the meantime, the people that I knew uh, from the RCA days, Tony Brown, for example, had moved to MCA. And Tony's like, hey, you want to work with Lyle Lovett? Here's, we got a new album. Hey, Pam, you want to work with Steve Earle? We got a new album. Uh, would you like to work with Nicolette Larson? How, how about, you ever heard of Patty Lovells? You want to work with Patty Lovells? So people were giving me work. And praise Jesus, um, CMA called me. I was doing projects with CMA. They needed a little bit of help. They, I'd go over to their office. So I was making a living. I had an apartment. And I did that for several years. Not that long, little, little, not too long. Um, but I was, okay, I'm going to be close to 25. I want to have a house by the time I'm 25. So I was very goal-oriented. So I think I was paying $400 a month rent in Nashboro Village. And I thought, well, this is cool because I'm on the golf course and I've got a fireplace. How cool is that? You know, I'm styling here. But I got sick of paying rent. So uh, my higher math, I figured out, high finance, that I could afford another $100 a month to go toward a mortgage. So I started looking for a place to live. And that limited where I could leave. Live. I was certainly not going to be able to move to Belmead, you know, or Franklin. So I um, bought a house in East Nashville. It was a bungalow, but it was mine for $49,000. And I was like, okay, good. And I had to call my dad to co-sign on the loan, which was humiliating. But he was really proud of me. And, he, and I had, you know, I had all the down payment and everything. And he was like, tell you what, I'll co-sign. And if you default, I'll have a vacation house in Nashville. Don't worry about it. So that was my first house. And um, then I just worked. That's all I did. I rolled up my sleeves. I worked. One day I get a phone call. I'll segue into, you probably want to ask me about management stuff. 
I get a phone call from a guy named Bob Doyle. And Bob is um, from Missouri. I'm pretty New York direct. Bob is not. So I kept having meetings with him and I'm like, I don't know what he wants. I don't know why he's meeting with me. Does he, is he hitting on me? I mean, what does he want? And he finally said, I'm leaving ASCAP. I'm starting a management company. I met this boy and I want you to talk to him, listen to him. If you like him, are you interested in forming a management company? Well, I go and meet this boy. He happens to be six foot one or two, I don't know what he is, but he's a pretty big guy. It's Garth, Garth Brooks. Garth is four years younger than I am, and we talk, and I'm like, there's something about this guy. Okay, yeah, I'd like to work with him. So, you know, it's kind of like, how much have you got in your credit card? You know, <laughs> let's, let's put our, put our, you know, cast our fortunes together, if you will, and let's see what we can do. And Bob used to say, he says, you know, I feel like the old, uh, Mickey Rooney movies with uh, uh, Judy Garland and it's like hey let's do a play you know and that's how we were it was really scrappy and we were going to do this management company together and um, put a put toilets together first client was Garth and we went around knocking on doors trying to get try to get some songs put together Bob has great ears and Garth was writing at the time for Bob's publishing company and we thought we had some decent songs to bring to record labels. So uh, at the time, there were a lot of record labels. And we were turned down 11 times, <laughs> last of which was Capitol Records. And uh, Bob, this story, everybody probably knows this story already, but um, I was at home. I think I was reading a book or watching te television. Bob and Garth were going to drop by the Bluebird. I wasn't even going to go. It was just, we're going to stop by and do a couple of songs, no big deal. And um, this guy was late to perform. And they said, Garth, go on and go up and sing. Are you ready? Have you got a guitar? Are you ready to sing? So Garth gets up there and he sings a couple of songs. And in the audience was an A&R executive from Capitol Records named Lynn Schultz, who was my friend, actually, because I had done a bunch of projects for Capitol Records. Um, and... Lynn says to Bob, how do we leave this thing, is how he put it. How do we leave this thing, Bob? And he says, what do you mean? You passed on us. He said, call me tomorrow. I think I missed something. Call me tomorrow. Let's talk. So I'm laying in bed, and the phone rings, and it's like 11 o'clock or whatever, and it's Bob. And he said, guess what? We're supposed to call Capital tomorrow. He said, you know Lynn better than I do. We, we got to go have a meeting. I'm like, okay, fine, no problem. We go over there. They offer us a deal. And now we have to find a producer. So Bob wanted to use Jerry Kennedy at the time. Well, Lynn and Jerry didn't get along. I'm like, well, that's not going to work, right? So I'm like, what about Alan Reynolds? How about Alan? Because I was listening to Garth talking about his influences and kind of what I knew about Alan. Like, he didn't have tons and tons of projects. He was very focused. He had, uh, he had worked with Crystal Gale. He, Worked with Kathy Matea. He was really like a, he really knew songs. He was he knew words, and he, he had a great publishing company. And you know people like you know Jim Rooney and and Pat Alder were working with him. And and I'm like you know I think that would be a cool place. So Bob's like okay. I, I, he knew him. I didn't know him. I just knew of him, and I had read about him, and you know thought he was a cool guy, and I knew people that knew him. Bob picked up the phone, and, and we went and took a meeting. And he was like, okay, I'll, uh, he listened. And he said, yeah, I could do this. And he got along really well with Lynn. So the good thing was they let us go in and do that project and left us alone. And so it was kind of really a deal memo. We went ahead and did a full album, and Lynn stayed out of the studio. And it's across the street. We'll show you later uh, the uh, place that we recorded. And then the crazy merry-go-round started. I think there's a lot of things. I think, I really believe that there's, there's, you, there's timing, but you have to know when there's opportunity, you have to seize it. You have to recognize it. And I think Bob and Garth and I were very different people, but together it was an amazing trio going forward. And Garth was the kind of guy that kids looked up to, women wanted to go out with, men wanted to have a beer with, and grandparents were like, why want to come over and hang out, you know? They just thought he was a nice young man. And so he kind of had all of that. 
He was nice looking, but he wasn't like too gorgeous. He was uh, set himself apart from George Strait. He used to say, if I looked as good as George Strait, I, I wouldn't have to run around like a maniac. So he set himself apart being dynamic on stage. That didn't happen right away. I, I used to say to him, why don't you look at videos and look at, you know, who, who are your heroes? Well, I really like this person. I like, I like Kiss. I said, why don't you listen? Why don't you, you know, who do you like listening to? Let's set you apart. Why don't you rent some videos? At the time, you could rent videos. And look at what Billy Joel's doing. You like Billy Joel? Don't copy him, but look at how he works a crowd. Don't copy George Strait, but look at how he works a crowd. And so that's what he did. He was a great student. And, of course, Kiss. And then he had influences of Towns Van Zandt because that's who his family listened to. And his mom was a singer. His mother had a single deal at Capitol. So he had it in the genes of being an entertainer. And Garth had been, his own words, a human jukebox all the years that he was at uh, university. And so he really knew how to work a crowd. And he, he was physical because he was an athlete. He played four sports. So it, it was something new. It was something refreshing. He was kind of self-deprecating. And he could be goofy. And he could be funny. And he could be passionate. And he was something different. And at the time, there were lots of what they called hat acts. And so, of course, um, there was Clint Black, Ricky Van Shelton, George Strait. All these guys were happening, and then a guy named Randy Travis came out. And Randy was traditional country, but very different from Garth. That's the kind of the crop of what was happening in the 80s and 90s. Reba was really in her prime then. Uh, certainly Vince was hitting his stride. It was a great, amazing time to be in Nashville. Amazing music coming out of here. We were different because of the physicality of the shows because of the way that Garth would do an interview. You know, he never went to media training, and so he would cry and he would be emoting and he would, he was a force to be reckoned with, he was different. And then we had things happen that we capitalized on. And, and I will say that because Bob and I did everything in house, so we had a management company. I did PR and marketing, I was also a 50-50 partner in the management company. So there was it was seamless. Anything that happened, I could jump on. We never counted on the record label to publicize anything. You know, if they did it, that was like gravy. That's fantastic. But the meat and potato, we, we had it basically at Doyle Lewis. We hired independent promotion. We were paying for radio promotion. Bob and I were. And the record label said, well, why are you doing this? We have a promotion department. We're like, well, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And we got signed, and then there was this huge turnover, and Jimmy Bowen came in and fired everybody except one person. And Garth was already on his way to being platinum. And Jimmy Bowen specifically said, well, how do you think this makes it look to my team that you, the top act, has its own promotion? And we're like, but it's working, Jimmy. We'll work with you guys, but, you know, just we, this is our team. This is our machine, and it's working. So I think we did a lot of stuff in-house. Bob and I were putting our own money in. And with good dividends, eventually we started making money, of course. But I think that was part of what happened. And we did things like, I remember one radio seminar. His first single was, I'm much too young to feel this damn old. That was the first single. And we had buttons done. And I was sticking them on people. I stuck one on Joe Galani. He was like, yeah, I feel that way. I am too much too young to feel as damn old. He had no idea that he's walking around with his competition's button on his lapel. And we did stuff like that. And it was like literally, like I'm not saying we had tons of money. We didn't. We just got creative. It was like, okay, we need to do a billboard ad. We, we really should do something in billboard. So we'd go to the label, and the label's like, we're not doing that. So Bob would, Bob would be like, how much money do you have in your checking account? And I was like, ah, this is And he was like, I have this much. Okay, we're going to pool our resources. We're going to do a billboard ad. And it was like very scrappy, when I say scrappy. And I can remember Bob saying, well, I think we should go talk to so-and-so and get some advice. I'm like, oh, no, we can't do that. And he's like, why not? I said, because I don't want him to think we don't know what we're doing. <laughs> it was just like, seriously, it was like, and, um, and Garth was an amazing hard worker. And he had, 
instincts for PR and marketing because that's what he studied in college. So we could sit down and we could brainstorm and it wasn't like, I'm not doing that. And I remember one time he got, he got really, he was tired and he got really ticked and he said, why do I keep having to do these interviews, Pam? And they keep asking me these stupid questions and don't you prepare them? Like, don't you send them stuff to read before they interview me? And I said, yes, I do. I can't guarantee they're gonna read it. And you've gotta answer these questions until you are a household name, until everybody knows who you are. And then you don't have to answer these questions. I want them to know that you're from Oklahoma. I want them to know how you met Sandy. I want them to know how you got your record deal. And then they will believe in you and they will come to see you perform and they will buy your records. And I remember uh, Raymond Brooks, his dad, said one time, son, he said, you can't give people back their time. So make sure that their time is well spent. So give them a good performance. And he also said, you know, son, you got to get in here, meaning your heart, before you get in here, meaning the pocket, your back pocket, your wallet. And Raymond was a trip. I mean, both he and his mother and his dad, and I was close to both of them, they were forces to be reckoned with. Um, and so he, he had an amazing work ethic, and he was driven, beyond driven. And I think that was sort of the secret, and Bob and I were very different, but it worked. Uh, I was kind of like, it just, the differences is what was it, how the magic happened. And uh, we just, like, worked our tails off, honestly. I mean, I, I would forget to eat, which is hard to believe, but I would I know what Garth ate. You know, he would have a Dr. Pepper and a club sandwich. That pretty much, I could tell you that's what he was gonna, when he was trying to lose weight, he would eat chicken and rice. And it would be like, why do I know that? And I don't even remember if I ate. And, and uh, I would come, I didn't have a boyfriend or anything, so I just like humped and worked all the time. And I can remember coming to, the office and we would be nominated for an award for the ASCAP award or you know whatever it was and certainly the CMAs and I just would work all day and I'd have my dress in the back and I'd put a little deodorant on <laughs> to fix my hair and we'd go to the award show it didn't occur to me to take a spa day or go get my hair done or get some eyelash extensions or you know let me go shop for a dress I'm like what's in the closet you know I mean that's how it was it was very you know, not and the fluffy Academy at of all. Country Music Awards Entertainer of the Year is. Garth Brooks. Thanks a lot. I got a, uh, I got a tremendous amount of people to thank for this. I'd, uh, I'd like to start off by thanking, uh, very, very personally thanking my band and my crew that's out on the road with us. We're a family together. I would like to thank uh, my lovely wife, Sandy, and our brand new baby girl, Taylor, back home. Hey, Taylor. I would like to thank uh, Liberty Records. Uh, they've been sweet to me. I'd like to thank uh, Bob Doyle and Pam Lewis. I would like to thank God above Almighty for everything that he has given me. And I'd, uh, I'd really like to thank all you all out there. God bless you and thanks for everything. And also, um, you didn't get in photographs. You, it was so frowned upon to jump in a photo. It was just like, that's really gurming. That was considered gurming. And I think of the people I've met that I really wish I had gotten a photo with Barbara Walters and Jane Pauley and all these people that I met. But you just didn't do that. It just was kind of not considered professional. And, um, and I just didn't want, I wanted to be taken seriously. I didn't want Garth's wife to be jealous of me. I didn't want uh, the label to think that I didn't know what I was doing or that I was just a fan. And so it was really important that I didn't get drunk, that I didn't sleep around, that I, you know, kind of like, I'm, I, I was sort of felt often like, you're just lucky to be in the room. Just, you know, mind, mind yourself, little lady. You're just lucky to be in the room. I remember one marketing meeting at Capitol, and it was Bob and myself, and I don't believe Garth was there. And the marketing guy never made eye contact with me for an hour and a half. It was just really demoralizing to not be taken seriously as a professional. 
And I was, I remember being really angry and leaving that meeting, knowing that I was going to be the one putting these marketing plans together, executing the marketing plans, working with the marketing department at Capital. And that really wasn't what Bob was doing. He was doing other stuff for Garth. And I walked out of the meeting and I was peeved. And Bob says, what's wrong with you? And I said, this was not cool, what just happened. And he goes, what do you mean? I said, not only did Joe Blow not look at you, not, not only was I ignored in the meeting, not only did he not look at me, validate me, listen to me, but neither did you. And I said, you know, really? I'm sorry, I'm not trying to be like a in-your-face feminist, but that's not cool, Bob. It's not cool. And um, then one time I'm at a Christmas party and we had started working with Garth and um, Jimmy Bowen had taken over. And Jimmy Bowen's a power, power, powerhouse guy. I mean, he was just amazing record guy. And <clears throat> we had a meeting at his house. We were doing really well at the time. We were on our way to being platinum. And he was like, I've got it all worked out. You're going to open for Hank Jr. And Bob's like, we've sat there looking. We're like, we don't really think that's the right audience. And so that's basically what we told Bowen. And Bowen was like shocked. Like he thought that was great that he had organized this. And we're like, yeah, it's probably not really. No, he, no, Hank's got a different audience or whatever. So Bowen says to Garth, and Garth used to pace, you know, when he was thinking, he would pace. And so <laughs> Bowen's sitting there, he's kind of walking. Like, like look at him like this while he's watching and walking around. And he was like, hey, you know, man, Garth, hey, hey man, you just, you got to trust me. I know what I'm talking about. And he says, Bowen, trust's on a bus. And it's down the road a piece, but it hasn't gotten here yet. And I'm sitting there going, oh, my God. So consequently, that didn't go that well. Um, so um, I'm at a Christmas party. And a guy named Robert Orman, Robert K. Orman, who used to be uh, the entertainer reporter, had just done an interview with Jimmy Bowen, talking about talking to him about his plans for the new record label. So he says, "Well, I'm really excited about this kid, Garth Brooks, but I'm not sure about his management. We might have to make some changes there." So I walk into this Christmas party, and I'm with a, a date, and everybody's been drinking, and we're like an hour later than everybody had gotten there earlier. And uh, Robert K. Orman, Bob, Bob Orman, my friend, proceeds to tell this story that basically we're, they're not too impressed with us at the record label. And I am beyond humiliated. I am mortified. I am angry and I am mortified. And there's all these people standing there. And I had a drink, and I guess I st we stayed for a little while. And I get home, and I call Bob. And, I, and he goes, what's wrong with you? And I told him a story. And he says, what are you going to do? And I said, well, I'm not working like this. He goes, what do you mean you're not working like this? I said, I would like to know if Garth is thinking of leaving us, I would like to know now. He said, what are you going to do? I said, I'm going to call Garth. What do you mean? What do you think I'm going to do? He's like, are you sure? I'm like, Bob, really? It's hard enough trying to break an artist without knowing what is going on. So I call Bob. I call Bob first, and then I call Garth. And Garth's like furious, furious. And that galvanized the, our relationship even more because it was like nobody's going to break this team up. We are going to have independent promotion. We are going to do things our way. We are going to work hard. We will be cordial to the record label. But So that's kind of like it was sort of, interesting scenario at the time. He didn't write it. Um, I love Tony Arata. I just love the dance. I would have to say that. And I love the video that we did. Uh -huh. And I called Tony to come and see it and he started crying. He was like, this is even more spectacular than I thought. This is so much more than I thought it could be. It was really, really beautiful. Trish! Trish the dish, yes. So, Garth always had an eye for the ladies, and he was um, singing demos to make extra money. And one day he went to sing a demo, and Bob and I were working, and he comes walking in, he's all animated, and he's in a really great mood, and he's like, oh my God, Pam, Bob, 
you got to meet this woman. She's amazing. She's from Georgia. She's Mon Monticello, Georgia, and she's got this amazing, like Linda Ronstadt voice. I've never heard a voice like this, and we sound really great together. We just sang on some demos, and I got to talking to her, and she, she's amazing, and she went to Belmont, and blah, 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 and you need to meet her. And I'm like, I look at Bob, I'm like, he's smitten. <laughs> and he was, and, and uh, anyway, so he was like, you need a manager. He said, you, you gotta help her. So we started working with her, and trying to get her a record deal, and we got her a deal at MCA, and Garth Fundus produced her, and right out of the box, first single, number one, She's in love with a boy. So it was amazing. Incredibly talented woman. And I don't think she gets the credit that she deserves. She's so spot on. And of course they fell in love and you now they're married. They're still married all these years. So good for them, right? You know. At the top of the street is Belmont Mansion and Belmont College. So this was all basically part of the Belmont estate, and Adelisha Ackland was the wealthiest woman in America. And the houses around here were 1920s, 1930s, maybe one or two Victorian, but it was essentially a residence that um, was going to get a road through it. And so it was a place that people could rent and uh, be able to hang out a shingle and not pay a whole lot of money for a building or for rent. And that's how the music industry sort of developed here. It was very much, um, I would say, kind of hard scrabble at first. And then little by little, publishing companies came, performing rights organizations came, record labels came, and everything just grew. So when I moved here in the 80s, it was still a big small town. and. A friend of mine, John Lomax, used to call it a campus. Everybody would run into each other. If one studio needed a, bike, a mic and uh, something broke or they needed a new amp or they needed strings, I mean, people would collaborate and work together. There was a Harlan Howard birthday bash and the whole streets would, cl would close up. There were number one parties. Uh, it was really easy to get into fanfare, which was held at the time at our fairgrounds. And you would just go over to Capitol Records and they were going to do the morning show and you would say, could I please have a pass for the morning show? And they would give you a pass and you'd go backstage and you'd have breakfast for Capitol. And then maybe RCA would be doing lunch and you'd have a pass for RCA and then maybe the dinner show would be MCA. And it was very much community oriented. And people would just drop in. And that's something I didn't understand or really get that how the casualness of the community because when working in New York, you made an appointment. I was working in a skyscraper. People didn't just drop in to take a meeting or whatever, or let's have a beer or something. It didn't happen. So it was much more informal at the time. And of course, there were these small homes, by and large, maybe 5,000 square foot homes and smaller. And in the last 10 years, uh, there have been lots of growth pre uh, pressures as the city has moved this way and the music industry has changed and some people felt that they wanted to sell their building for wealth building and I can un totally understand that and they sold out. Ray Stevens sold out, a lot of people sold out and of course they didn't sell to other music companies, they sold to apartment complexes and developers and hotels. We've got a Virgin Hotel at the, cor at the corner here and so it, it's really gutted this community. We still have over 200 businesses that are music related businesses. I was lucky enough to buy several buildings. I've held on to them. They've been paid for and inhabited for years, thank God. And pretty much everybody I rent to is music related. And even I have a massage therapist upstairs. A lot of his clients are music people. Uh, we have a singing success. They teach music lessons and vocal lessons. We have an accountant down the street. All of his clients are music related. So uh, of course we have artist managements that have rented. So there's still the core of Music Row is here. Please don't confuse Music Row and downtown. Downtown is tourists, downtown is honky tonks. This is where the music takes place. This is where it, the studios are still, although there's some in Franklin, there's some studios in Berry Hill. But it's where the music is made. It's where the management companies, many of them. And of course, then we had something like COVID happen and people are working out of their house now and people can work remotely. But at the time, it was very much a sense of community, and it's dissipated a little bit. 
these houses are all, uh, the, the, the houses that I own are all 30s, I would say 20s, 30s, 40s is the kind of the core of the houses. I bought five houses, I sold one, and I have four in the contiguous lots. So they're, you know, very valuable now for someone to knock down and, and build a high rise. I would rather that doesn't happen and as long as I can hang on, I'd like to, to keep the core. And I think that the power of place is very important. Being able to tell a story, being able to say, well, that's where Sunday morning coming, coming down was written. And that's where Garth recorded. And I remember having a conversation with Mayor Briley at the time, and I said, would you get on a plane, fly to Italy to stand in front of where the Roman Forum once stood? And there's a sign there now. And we are a young country. The rest of the world, thousands and thousands and thousands of years. I mean, we had a land mass here, and we had indigenous people, but we didn't have a lot of settlement. So we have, what, 400, 500 years of history? And I, I really get very uh, disappointed when we knock it down and we don't preserve it and we don't tell those stories. And I think storytelling is so, so crucial. I have, I've never lived in a new place. I've never, I, I, I resonate with older structures and I love old architecture and I've traveled all through the world and uh, I wanted to preserve as much as I could of Music Row and there was a contingency of people that agreed and we started Save Music Row and there's been signs put up and people are free to sell their buildings I totally understand that I was hoping that there would be a movement that would want to to save what is the core of Music Row. There's a sign out front, please take a look at it, and it, it actually tells about the history, it tells about the original plat that was here, and it's hard to imagine, this was a little neighborhood, and then it just kind of grew into the pressures of the music business. And uh, things change, I, I understand that. I always like to repurpose if at all possible. I like to have as little as possible in the landfill. So I love it when you can see a building, like Garth purchased the building across the street where we cut all his hits. He bought it from Alan Reynolds. Alan was getting out of the music industry, sold it to him, and it was Drac at Jack's Tracks. Then it was um, Alan's studio, and now it's Allentown, and it's owned by Garth. So it's a really beautiful transition. And Garth wanted more room. He didn't knock the building down, he put an addition. And it's seamless, it's a beautiful addition. So that's what I like to see is when there's some sensitivity and uh, creativity with regards to repurposing. And it can happen, it's just, you just have to think outside the box a little bit. Um, so the preservation, we, we were able to do some zoning and so the high rises are on one side, Demombrian, and as you approach Belmont, it's now there was, there was a less density in the zoning. So we were able to get some progress. So lots of meetings and did some, some good, thank God. Uh, not as much as I would have liked, but you know, it's, it's a start. And I guess I, I've always had preservation in my genes because of my parents. They were both preservationists and were involved with saving a revolutionary, uh, Circa Revolutionary Inn that is in our little town and uh, my mom used to do little archaeological digs and find you know clay pipes and Indian arrowheads or whatever and I got drugged to museums as a kid and I just grew to love history and want to preserve history and want to interpret history and that's how we met it was because of the love of history and I love this country and I think people should travel it's really sad to me that only 20% of Americans have passports <laughs> and that there's so much out there to see and to learn and to grow and think, you know what, we could do that. That's something to think about. And so when I was looking for a place to get a, uh, I was renting at the time, I was renting um, office space and I um, had a lady that was showing me office space but also showing me my, uh, a house that I ended up buying she was going to lose her commission because I, the house that I bought, I bought through the Resolution Trust Company. So I said, hey Mary Lou, you've spent a year and a half showing me around. We've look, been looking at farms and houses and whatnot. And I said, I don't want you to lose out on a commission. You've been so good to me. 
find me a place to buy on Music Row. She's like, well, you're really sweet. Nobody does that. I'm like, well, I don't want you to lose out. I don't want to take advantage of you. So we're driving around and we drove past these buildings. There's a couple of signs and they were horrible. They, one was a flop house on the corner. There was one stone house, which is now a big machine. That was halfway decent. And the other two buildings were literally falling down. I mean, the bricks had separated. And I said, find out how much they want for that. And she's like, are you nuts? I said, well, just find out. What the heck? Find out how many houses, because we couldn't really tell. There were two signs. We really didn't know. So she made a phone call, and she calls me back. And she said, Katie Gore owns them. So it's Al Gore, Vice President Al Gore's aunt owned the buildings. And she liked me. She liked that I was a woman. And she didn't want to sell to a man, I guess. So I said, offer her four, because they need a lot of work. So I paid $400,000, and then I was like, okay, called my attorney, and he, he said, who do you think you are, Donald Trump? And I needed to move money around, because I had bought my house, and I had, I had bought this property, so I had to move money and start renovating. So it took some time, probably three or four years to renovate. We did one building at a time, and then you know, moved in, moved my PR marketing company in, and then started running it out. So it was an, I felt it was important to have a diversified income source as well. And I always learn from Tammy Wynette, who never gave up her beautician's license. You know, you just don't put all your eggs in one basket. So the whole time I was managing Garth, even though Garth and Bob were like, you should close that PR firm. Why don't you close that PR firm? I'm like, nah. I started it before I even knew you guys. And, you know, you just never know how things go. I just, I would feel more comfortable if you don't mind. And is there something I'm not doing for you? You know, is there something that, you know, because I would hire people to run the PR company. And um, they're like, well, no, but we just really would rather you don't do that. And I'm like, okay, well, it's just, that's what, you, you have a publishing company, Bob. You have other writers. What's the difference, you know? You have other investments. What's the difference? So, um, yeah, it was interesting. Here we are. So. The Harrison House is, has a personality all its own. And I found out about the Harrison House. Uh, and once again, you just never know. I took, I took a meeting I did not want to go to. It was uh, regarding uh, a project that uh, realtors wanted Garth to do, and they wanted him to do a museum on De Mombrian. I'm like, he's not going to do that. And I said, I'll tell you what, give me the paperwork. I will be happy to present it. And it was a lunch meeting. And I said, I'll tell you, as an aside, as I'm leaving, I said, I'm looking for a house if you have anything. So the, the guy called me, and he said, well, i got this place in Franklin. You're probably not interested but I'll be happy to show it to you. And he was over this house because he wanted to subdivide everything. It was lots of acreage in this brick house. And these crazy preservationists were like, because it's on the National Register. And this had been going on for like decades. And also, the city wouldn't extend sewer because the sewer it was not in the city limits at the time and they wouldn't extend sewer and it was a deal breaker and he was trying to figure out how he was going to move sewer up one hill and down it was going to be cost very costly so it, the deal was queered and it was like this really annoying house that he didn't he just wanted to unload it and i drove out there and i was like wow okay need some work but this place is amazing so i bought it so now i bought this property and bought that property. I was suddenly very rich in real estate, <laughs> but they, everything needed help, needed work. So I didn't move out there right away because I already had my $49,000 house in East Nashville that I was living in, and, and that was before I was making more money. So I just kept stashing money and stashing money, investing money, investing money, and living in this house, and it didn't even have a garage. So the funny thing is, is one year for Christmas, Garth gave me a Jaguar. I had no place to park it. The, the car was worth more than my house, and I freaked out. And I'm like, what am I going to do with this car? So I call my friend Gary, and he's like, are you okay? Is everything okay? Cause I said, get over here. He says, what's wrong? I said, you need to do something with this car. I don't, it's, someone's going to steal it. I don't know where to park it. I, it, it so it sat at the Thoroughbred dealership until I moved and had a garage. That's the truth. I was like, what am I doing with this car? Even though I love the car. So I was like, you know, I'm basically... I, how did I end up here? I don't even know. So 
I commenced to renovate the Harrison House, which is on the National Register. It was General Hood's command post during the Battle of Franklin. It was a spy headquarters for Annie Briggs Harrison, who was the daughter-in-law, and it was one of 44 field hospitals. So there's a lot of history there. And this Yankee music person buys it. Well, you can imagine the consternation. I start getting these notes at my back door. And there's notes from Mary Pierce, Rick Warwick, Robert Hicks, Ridley Wills, and anybody else. And they really want me to call them back. Oh, so-and-so's got a, a sofa they want me to look at. Oh, this person, this is who you should call for paint. They want to know what I'm going to do with this house. And I'm thinking, A, they've, all these people have trespassed. What are they doing on my property? I'm not here. Who the heck are they? Don't they have anything better to do than to worry about my, me and my house? And so I met one of the people was Mary Pierce, Rudy Jordan. I mean, this cast of characters, Lily and Stuart. And I'm thinking, what in the heck is with this town? I just wanted to have like a, a little place to chill and have my horse. I was driving back and forth at Clarksville to go horseback riding. And that's what changed my life. And I met Mary Pierce and she's like, Pam, you just need to be a good steward. I'm like, what the hell is a good steward? What are you talking about, be a good steward? Well, we have to protect your view shed. I'm like, what in the world is a view shed? So I was like baptism by fire with preservation. And then she's like, well, will you open your house, Pam? And we want to do a tour. I'm like, what? Why would anybody want to see my house? And why would I want strangers traipsing through my house? So of course, I've had my house on tour. I, I know what a view shed is now. I have written checks for preservation. I have volunteered for preservation. I have, you name it. I have stopped developments. I have, I ran for office. And I'm still involved with the city because once you kind of, you know, someone, Lillian said to me, well, once under you pick up, once you peek under the dress, you know, that's it. You just, you, you're hooked. And so I'm still involved with uh, Franklin politics. And I can get my phone calls returned. People know who I am. I'm, I'm on two mayor appointed commissions and I'm involved with affordable housing or attainable housing initiative with Hard Bargain. I'm on the housing commission. I'm on the Civil War Sur Commission for the city. And uh, I just love my town, and I love lovely Franklin. And, um, and I, I'm also involved in preservation efforts here in, in Nashville with the Nashville City Cemetery and with Belmont Mansion. I'm back on the board with Belmont Mansion. And it's sort of, to me, it's a very important, uh, I guess it's a, I will paraphrase, I believe it's a biblical verse, but to those, what to, much is given, much is expected. And I really feel like it's, I think it's my tithe to give back of my time and my treasure. And this little book, I was prompted to write because it was the sesquicentennial. And we were doing lots of activities. We had battle reenactment. We were doing luminary uh, lighting. And I thought, well, I need to kind of put my thoughts together. And I am not a historian. I'm just a crazy lady who bought an old house. And it really changed my life. And so that's what this book is about, is how buying this house changed my life. So it's filled with little stories. It's got some history. It has my story. It's not Garth-centric. It's like I didn't want to write a Garth Brooks memoir about being management. I wanted to write about the dynamic parts of my life that I care about. So, uh, yeah, Tennessee Yankee, that's what it's about. Love me.